Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please give us a readings and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Our topic for today is the prevention and treatment of diabetes. 90 to 95% of those with diabetes have type 2. Diabetes and pre-diabetes are epidemic and the prevalence continues to increase in the United States and around the world. 9.4% of adults in the U.S. are diabetic, as many as 15% in some of the states, and this equates to approximately 30 million Americans, and 87 million people in the U.S. have pre-diabetes, with some estimates quite a bit higher, especially since many people do not know that they have this since at this stage, there may not be any symptoms. And rates are especially climbing among children and teens. So at least one out of three, and possibly as many as one out of two Americans have diabetes or pre-diabetes. And diabetes is a particularly nasty disease. It significantly increases your risk of heart attack and stroke. Diabetes is the number one cause of chronic kidney disease and kidney failure, and it accounts for 60% of all lower limb amputations. Diabetes frequently results in diabetic retinopathy, which can cause vision loss and blindness. Diabetes also increases the risk of various other eye problems, including glaucoma and cataracts. One of the most common complications of diabetes is diabetic neuropathy, whose symptoms include tingling, numbness, and or pain in the extremities, especially in the feet and legs. Diabetes also significantly increases the risk of cognitive decline, as well as the risk of falls in older people. And the biggest strategy, tragedy is that diabetes is largely preventable. Dr. Brian Mole is the founder and medical director of Sweet Life Diabetes Health Centers. He's a master licensed diabetes educator and certified to practice functional medicine by the Institute of Functional Medicine. He organizes the highly successful annual Diabetes Summit and consults with clients worldwide as a diabetes coach. Dr. Moles, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to, uh, to, uh, to be on the podcast. Excellent. So can we begin by explaining, perhaps we can begin the discussion by uh, explaining what type 2 diabetes is and why is it so prevalent today? Yeah, it's a good question. You just did a good job of laying out some of the statistics and facts and some of the scary things about diabetes. You're right. It is the leading cause of adult blindness, lower limb amputation, kidney failure, which leads to dialysis, uh, causes sexual dysfunction in men and women, uh, leads to other hormone imbalances. There's uh, concomitant issues with uh, thyroid uh, disorders, and uh, we see other complications like dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and as you mentioned, uh, both peripheral and autonomic neuropathy. So that leads to uh, gastrointestinal issues uh, from the autonomic neuropathy, and uh, we see uh, lower limb, uh, even sometimes in the hand, usually in the feet and toes, numbness, tingling, pain, sometimes very severe pain uh, resulting from uh, diabetes. And uh, the difference between type 1 and type 2, which uh, will help me to kind of talk about what type 2 is, uh, is really night and day. They're, they're a totally different disease. In fact, I oftentimes wish they didn't have the same name. <laughs> uh, type 1 is a classic disease. It's an autoimmune condition where uh, usually sometime in childhood, uh, I've seen as young as under a year to as old as late teens, uh, they uh, will develop autoantibodies against 
uh, something in the uh, blood sugar regulation system. So it could be uh, the insulin producing cells of the pancreas or enzymes that are involved in insulin production or insulin itself, but some sort of autoantibody against uh, the blood sugar control system, often leading to pancreatic destruction. So the, the pancreas, the organ that makes insulin, which controls blood sugar, gets destroyed. And therefore, people with type 1 diabetes need to be on insulin for the rest of their lives. So before insulin was discovered in the 1920s, or at least uh, isolated and formulated in the 1920s, there was no cure or even treatment really for type 1 diabetes. And what happens there is people waste away. So uh, essentially, uh, they can't store energy so they lose all their fat, they start to lose all their muscle mass, they become uh, almost like cachexic, like a cancer patient would, and uh, eventually wither away to nothing and, and their organs start to malfunction. So uh, in those cases, insulin is life-saving and they need to be on insulin for, uh, for the rest of their life. Type 2 diabetes, completely different. So uh, type 2 diabetes is more of a condition or a dysfunction than it is even a disease. And what happens in type 2 diabetes is we make plenty of insulin, but our cells become resistant to it. So again, insulin is a hormone made by uh, particular cells called beta cells in the pancreas, which helps us to store energy, in particular uh, glucose. So we uh, release insulin when we eat or when our uh, glucose levels in our blood start to get uh, higher than what is considered normal. And we take that sugar and we store it away uh, for later use. And that's the, that's the role of insulin. When the cells don't respond to that hormone anymore, though, uh, we can't store away that extra fuel. So the glucose levels in our blood go up. Uh, also, the fat levels in our blood typically go up. So we see high triglycerides, which ultimately leads to high cholesterol. We see high glucose, uh, which leads to all sorts of problems uh, and damage that we talked about earlier. I guess there's even a diabetes type 1.5. I was talking to another doctor about yeah, type 1.5 is kind of a slang term, um, but there are other forms of diabetes. So um, I, I try to steer away from that because there's not a lot of agreement on what it actually is. Oh, okay. So like some people use type 1.5 to describe people who have type 2 diabetes and their pancreas burns out and then, then they become insulin dependent, um, which I would call uh, insulin dependent type 2 diabetes. But uh, other people use it to describe uh, what's really known as LADA, L-A-D-A, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. And right. that is a condition where uh, it's similar to type 1. Uh, it's an autoimmune uh, manifestation that affects the blood sugar regulation system. Again, there's uh, about four or five different antibodies that can be affected here and, and different uh, mechanisms within that, but oftentimes leads to destruction of the pancreas. The difference is it happens later in life, so typically past the age of 20, and it's much more slowly progressing and may not lead to total pancreatic destruction. So we have a lot of LATA clients, for example, who uh, don't need to be on insulin, who can just maintain good blood sugar with a low-carb diet and, and exercise and so forth. But, uh, but that's oftentimes described as type 1.5. There's another thing called MODI, which is a uh, sort of a mutation uh, that uh, leads to high blood sugar. And there's other things that sometimes people call type 1.5. But um, I think the big one is uh, this latter condition, which is, is an autoimmune diabetes that uh, instead of affecting kids, affects adults and uh, shows up just a little bit differently. Okay, cool. And so why is diabetes so prevalent today? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And, and let's say type 2 diabetes for sure. Um, yeah, I think type yeah. 1 diabetes is, is probably on the rise slightly as well, but, uh, but not nearly the epidemic that we see in type 2 diabetes. And again, if we, uh, I like to look at type 2 diabetes as a spectrum. So uh, you know, we look at it almost like a spectrum dysfunction where uh, we can put along that spectrum uh, obesity, we can put along that spectrum 
um, uh, metabolic syndrome, which is elevated blood sugar, elevated lipids, uh, high blood pressure, overweight, um, and, uh, and uh, there's other factors that can be looked at as well. Then uh, I would say even dyslipidemia, which is just elevated cholesterol or triglycerides or uh, abnormal lipids, uh, PCOS, which is uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, is also related to this pre-diabetes uh, and type 2 diabetes. So to me, that's a spectrum there. And it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily get all of them and it doesn't necessarily progress that way. But to me, these are all a cluster of problems that are related to the same thing. And ultimately, type 2 diabetes is the pinnacle of that. It's, it's sort of the ultimate metabolic disaster where... Uh, our lifestyle and our environment uh, come together to create this perfect storm, which leads to metabolic breakdown. Uh, so if, I, if we want to get more specific on that, uh, poor diet, uh, processed, refined foods, including sugar and grain-based foods, as well as fats. So we see things like hydrogenated fats, which have kind of been phased out, but most of us grew up eating a lot of those. Um, and we, see, we still see refined vegetable oils, quote unquote, vegetable oils, industrial seed oils, like corn, canola, um, safflower, cottonseed oil, uh, soybean oil, and so forth. These are highly processed refined fats that uh, can drive uh, metabolic dysfunction. Um, and then all the uh, additives, preservatives, and other stuff that's, that's jammed into our food. We see more sedentary lifestyles. People aren't moving the way that we used to move. Uh, we have more sedentary jobs. Uh, we don't uh, get as much physical activity as we used to get in our evolutionary history. We have more stress. We're getting poor sleep. We have more toxins in our environment, which end up blocking insulin receptors and leading to weight gain and uh, visceral obesity or fat stored around the organs, which can lead to diabetes. We have gut dysbiosis and dysfunction, hormone imbalances, and the list goes on and on. So all of these things are part of this, uh, this group of contributing factors and causes that lead to this metabolic sort of perfect storm. Uh, which ultimately can put us along that spectrum of uh, gaining weight, uh, becoming insulin resistant, which uh, we, I mentioned earlier we can talk more about, and then ultimately leading to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Okay, cool. So which lab tests do you think are most beneficial for patients uh, to screen for potential diabetes or who already have existing diabetes? Well, there's really two problems in prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. The first is high blood sugar, but the second one is high insulin levels or hyperinsulinemia. So um, for sure, you should be checking your blood sugar. And I actually recommend that um, everybody goes out and gets a, an over-the-counter blood sugar meter. I recommend uh, one by Abbott called the... Um, uh, Precision Neo, NEO. It's it's relatively inexpensive. You can get it at any drugstore. You don't need a prescription, and you can check your blood sugar uh, whenever you want after meals, first thing in the morning, before you go to bed, and and it gives you some real time feedback. It's a great tool. Um, you know, I always you know say it'd be nice if we could measure every test that way. If we could check our thyroid function with a pinprick, if we could check you know, cardiovascular markers with a pinprick, it'd be, uh, you know, and it was cheap and, you know, affordable and easy to do. Uh, it, it, we'd have a lot more um, awareness, you know, when it comes to biomarkers. So anyway, uh, we have that with glucose. So let's check it. Um, secondly, um, there's a test called hemoglobin A1C, which is uh, sort of the uh, becoming the standard, not quite the standard yet, but becoming the standard in type 2 diabetes management. Um, it's not a perfect test, but it's a, it's a really good test. And essentially, uh, we describe it as sort of an average of your glucose over the past three to four months. What it really measures is damage to red blood cells, hemoglobin, um, done by elevated blood sugar. So there's a certain percentage of 
of these A1C receptors on hemoglobin and red blood cells that uh, can be glycated. And when it gets glycated, it means there's sugar molecules bound to them. And when it gets above a certain percentage, we know that the sugar's uh, running too high, actually causing damage to those cells. And the problem is when we see damage to those cells, we can extrapolate that and say, well, good chance there's damage being done to the lining of the blood vessels and to the kidneys and to the brain and to the other parts of the body, which are uh, at risk when it comes to high blood sugar. So hemoglobin A1C is a much more stable marker. Uh, normal, if anybody uh, wants to go get one, is 5.6 or less, 5.6% or less. Uh, we like to see it around five. Um, most of our clients will end up with an A1C between 4.8 and 5.5%. Percent uh, diabetes is diagnosed at 6.5 or greater, and prediabetes is 5.7 to 6.4. So uh, that's the hemoglobin A1C. I, as far I've as heard a, you, I've heard yeah. you describe uh, the glycation, which uh, not everybody is familiar with, as uh, caramel, caramelizing uh, the proteins. Yeah. So glycation is is. Uh, is what the hemoglobin A1C test measures on the red blood cell, but uh, other cells can get glycated like brain tissue, uh, like the lining of our blood vessels. And, and you're exactly right. What happens is that high, that sugar, that elevated glucose circulating around the bloodstream acts as like an oxidant. Um, and uh, I'm, your uh, audience has probably heard of oxidative stress, which is like rust on a bumper or uh, the browning of an apple when you take a bite out of it and leave it on the counter. That oxidation, uh, glycation is similar, but instead of oxygen, it's glucose doing the damage. It binds to certain protein molecules along in those cells and uh, yeah, caramelizes it. Like we, uh, we like to picture... Uh, a creme brulee, you know, they put some sugar on the top and heat it up with that little blowtorch and it, it forms that hard crust. That's what happens to our cells and our brain and our kidneys and our, on our blood vessels. And that's what leads to a lot of the complications of diabetes. That's pretty scary. Yeah, pretty nasty. Um, so do you recommend a glucose tolerance test where you uh, challenge them with sugar and then, and then measure the glucose again? You know, it's an interesting test, and I think it can be really helpful. Um, if people have diabetes already, I don't recommend doing it um, typically because essentially you're, you know, it's like, it's like somebody who you know has celiac disease saying, well, let's, uh, let's have you go eat a whole loaf of bread and a bowl of pasta and, and just kind of see what happens. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, mean, right? <laughs> uh, so, so I don't typically recommend it for people who have diabetes, but if you are in the pre-diabetic range or you, you know, your blood sugar, let's say you go in and have a fasting blood sugar test and normal, by the way, is around uh, 76 to 92 um, right, mid 80s is kind of perfect. So let's say you come back and the test is 99 or 103 or something like that. Then you may want to consider going and having a glucose tolerance test done. What you do there is take about a, it's usually a 75 gram load of glucose, which is like a sugar syrup that you drink. You check, they check your blood sugar before and then they'll check it at intervals after that. So usually it's 60, 90, 120 minutes. Um, you can also check insulin. So I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the other thing that happens with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes is elevated insulin levels. So you can also check insulin as part of a glucose tolerance test. It's called an insulin response test. And uh, you would again want to check fasting. And then you can see what happens to your insulin level. So sometimes... Uh, the glucose levels look okay. So fasting glucose is okay. Maybe it goes up a little bit too high after that glucose syrup. Um, the the uh, threshold to diagnose diabetes at that point is 200. So that's really high. Like if you do the glucose syrup and your blood sugar goes up to 180, uh, they say you're pre-diabetic, not, not type 2 diabetic. But that's still very, very high. So maybe it goes up higher than it should. Um, and 
uh, and then comes right back down. You may not know you have a significant problem, but if you check the insulin, sometimes what you'll see is uh, maybe fasting, it's normal, but when you take that glucose load, it shoots up super high. The insulin uh, post-glucose challenge should not really ever go above 30. And uh, sometimes we'll see it go up over 100 wow. uh, after a glucose challenge. And so what's happening there is the body's keeping the blood sugar down, but it's doing it by releasing like a surge of you know, industrial strength insulin in order to keep the blood sugar down. And that's not okay because that insulin causes us to store fat, particularly around the organs and in the liver. It causes us to, it, it's inflammatory. So uh, it circulates in our bloodstream, inflaming the blood vessels. High insulin levels needs to be degraded. And it's degraded by an enzyme in the brain that also degrades amyloid plaque. So when we're degrading all that insulin, uh, we don't have that enzyme to degrade amyloid plaque. So we get plaque buildup in the brain, which uh, is is one of the main links to Alzheimer's disease. So high insulin, even without high blood sugar, uh, can be a huge problem. And so that's why if you're going to do that test, uh, I would also test insulin at the same time. And when we look at fasting insulin, what is the optimal level? Because the range is actually pretty big for the normal. Yeah, so uh, the way I explain it, a lot of people don't realize, but you know that test is not a functional test. Most doctors will not order an insulin test to evaluate metabolic health or diabetes or prediabetes. They're essentially ordering it when they order it uh, because they suspect an insulinoma. An insulinoma is, is basically a tumor on the pancreas that uh, causes the excess release of insulin. So that reference range is really tied to insulinoma, not to uh, you know, functionally healthy insulin release. So we have to apply a functional range to that. And we do this in other things too, like thyroid, sometimes there's a functional range. Uh, we do the same thing with triglycerides. When, people, when doctors evaluate triglycerides, they're oftentimes evaluating for cardiovascular risk, not metabolic health. So we have a functional range with triglycerides as well. But the functional range for insulin fasting is, is 2.5 to 6. That's the range that we use. And so when it gets above 6, that's elevated. There's a, te there's a um, calculation you could do called HOMA-IR, H-O-M-A-I-R. It stands for Homeostatic Model of Assessment of Insulin Resistance. And uh, you multiply your fasting glucose times your fasting insulin and divide it by 405. And what happens there is it gives you a number. Uh, it should be close to one once it gets up over two. Uh, it's starting to get elevated. And what you'll see is if you have a fasting glucose of 85 and a fasting insulin of five, that puts you pretty much right at one. So uh, once that starts to grow, either the glucose or the insulin, your HOMA IR score goes up. And that's what many researchers use to assess insulin resistance in research studies. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but now I'd like to pause to tell you about the sponsor, for this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Pure Encapsulations, which is one of the few lines of professional nutritional supplements that I use in my office. Pure Encapsulations manufactures a complete line of hypoallergenic, research-based dietary supplements. Pure products are meticulously formulated using pure, scientifically tested and validated ingredients. They are free from magnesium stearate, gluten, GMOs, hydrogenated fats, artificial colors, sweeteners, and preservatives. Among other things, one of the great things about Pure Encapsulations is not just the quality products, but the fact that they often provide a range of different dosages and sizes, which makes it easy to find the right product for the right patient, especially since we do a lot of testing and we figure out exactly what the patients need. So, for example, with DHEA, they offer 5, 10, and 25 milligram dosages in both 60 and 180 capsules per bottle size, which is extremely convenient. Um, and now, 
back to our discussion. Are you familiar with the glycomark test? And is, is that a useful test? I like it too. That one uses triglycerides and glucose. So if you don't have a fasting insulin test, uh, you can do that one. Um, I can't remember the exact formula or the reference ranges, but um, it's similar. I think uh, there's a multiplication. Then you do like a, um, you have to use a, the log function, I think, on the uh, on your on your on a scientific calculator, which mo- most smartphones have, but it's uh, it's pretty cool, and it uh, it's it's yeah, it's good. I like it, and basically, um, it's a similar theory. The difference is instead of looking at insulin, you're looking at triglycerides, which is kind of a, a kind of a surrogate for insulin resistance. What we find is the more insulin resistance, the higher the triglycerides go. So most of our clients, after they do some care with us their triglycerides are down between like 40 and 70. And if they have triglycerides in that range and a glucose under 100, they're going to have a good glycomark. Uh, Once that triglyceride level starts getting up around 100 or higher, that glycomark is going to get elevated. So you, you just mentioned insulin resistance several times. Can you explain what insulin resistance is? Yeah, so um, I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't really dive into it too much. So we make this hormone insulin, which uh, actually is an energy preserver, really. So when we eat food, uh, if we eat extra uh, calories that we can't necessarily burn or utilize at this time, we store them. And insulin is the hormone that's largely responsible for that storage. So what happens is in the present, so when we eat food, uh, glucose in particular triggers the, the biggest insulin release, but um, fat will at some level, protein will at some level. When we eat those foods, uh, we release this hormone insulin. It kind of opens up storage. So storage in the liver, storage in the muscle, storage in the fat cells for extra energy. And uh, we take whatever we can't burn or use at the time, we, we you know, uh, sock it away for later use, so to speak. And what happens in insulin resistance is for one reason or another, and, and we can get into some of those reasons, our cells don't respond properly to that hormone. So we, uh, we describe it as like uh, insulin is a key that opens the door that would allow the glucose to get into the cell if we're talking about glucose. And if that key doesn't open the lock, like somebody stuck some gum in there or it's an old lock and it's just jammed, then the glucose can't get into the cell through that door. So it has to go look for another door. And fortunately, there are many doors on the cells, but the more and more insulin resistance there is, the less doors open and the less we're able to get glucose into the cell. Eventually, it starts to build up outside the room in this case, and and that's high blood sugar, hyperglycemia, and a hallmark of, of diabetes. So there are many causes for that insulin resistance. Um, and uh, one of the things I like to caution people is you'll hear a lot, this is the cause, that is the cause. Uh, like from the vegan community, we often hear, oh, it's too much fat in the diet. That's what causes insulin resistance. Well, that, that is just absolutely not true. Um, what they're doing there is conflating this idea of elevated fat and fat in the liver <clears throat> uh, contributing to insulin resistance, which is very much true with fat in the diet. And they're two totally different things. So fat in the bloodstream and fat in the liver and fat in the muscles is completely different than fat in the diet. So somebody who eats, uh, let's say, let's say somebody, somebody were to eat a thousand calories a day of only fat, uh, they're not going to build fat in their organs. They're not going to have extra fat floating around in their bloodstream because they're going to use all that fat to fuel their body. So it's not fat in the diet. It's, uh, it's fat stored in the organs and fat stored in the muscles and fat floating around in the bloodstream, which can be one of the causes of insulin resistance. We also have to look at chronic systemic inflammation. That is, in fact, I think the main driver of insulin resistance. There's uh, too much insulin. So my friend, Dr. Jason Fung, uh, uses this as his main cause, which again, I think that I have a little bit of a problem looking at it as the cause, but it is a cause. Uh, 
when you overconsume carbohydrates or just overconsume food in general, we release these surges of insulin. And the way he described it is like an alcoholic becomes uh, desensitized to alcohol. Uh, you know, uh, somebody who smokes becomes desensitized to nicotine. Uh, drug addicts become desensitized to whatever drug they're doing. We become desensitized to insulin. And that does happen. Um, there are studies showing we down-regulate insulin receptors when our insulin levels are high. So that's a cause. We have to, we have to also look at toxins, certain toxins, uh, environmental pollutants, POPs, and uh, other chemicals that are found in plastics in our food supply, in our water supply, in our air will actually interfere with insulin signaling at the cell level. So there's a lot of different things that can cause insulin resistance, but the bottom line is that lock gets gummed up, the key doesn't open the lock, the glucose can't get in to be burned for fuel, and it builds up in the bloodstream. Interesting. Yeah, I'd like to touch on the toxin thing, but I just wanted to mention, I just opened up an email from Tom O'Brien and he's speaking at a diabetes summit. And I thought, oh, it must be Dr. Mole's diabetes <laughs> summit. And it's called the Mastering Diabetes Summit. And I started looking at it and there were a number of talks about how the ketogenic diet is the worst thing in the world. And I thought, I don't think that's his <laughs> summit. <laughs> so yeah, it, not mine. No, no, no. Those are, they're friends of mine uh, who, who run that, but they're, uh, they're heavy duty vegan advocates. Basically they teach uh, plant-based ultra low fat diet, keep, keep fat grams under 30 a, a day, which is basically no fat and, um, and eat a lot of fruit. Um, I found that that doesn't work very well. Um, I've had a lot of clients who have tried that and, and failed spectacularly with it. So um, it does help some people. There are there are certain uh, genotypes, phenotypes, whatever, uh, that seem to respond well to a low-fat diet. Um, but the large majority of our clients, and I don't teach a high-fat diet, by the way, either, but the large majority of our clients seem to do really well with uh, a low-carbohydrate approach, uh, and avoiding processed refined foods, moderating protein, moderating fat, and uh, getting plenty of exercise, and then supporting the body systems to make sure the body's functioning optimally. So when you talk about a low carb, which, which, what is the best diet for most people with diabetes? Yeah, again, I, I found that a low carb approach makes sense. You know, carbohydrate foods, uh, in particular starch and sugar, uh, drive the production of insulin, which is known as a fat storing hormone. I mean, even the ADA and the American Association of Diabetes Educators say uh, throughout their you know information, and they're very very conservative that carbohydrates uh, by sh you know by a long stretch have or by a long shot have the greatest impact on. Uh, blood glucose levels and blood insulin levels. So, but but uh, traditionally, the ADA has tended over the years to promote a whole grain type of lower fat approach. Until recently. yeah, they, I'm not I'm not yeah I'm not saying that they're yeah. pushing low carb, but right. but they do say that carbohydrates have right. the greatest impact on blood sugar. So right. there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Yeah, um, they have. You're right. In, in recent years. Yeah. Yeah, and in recent years, they have started to warm up to low carb. Uh, this year, in fact, they're even saying it's a you know it's recommended as a viable path. Um, but they tend to uh, go with this idea that uh, diabetics deserve to eat whatever what everybody else eats. You know, that's sort of their general mission um, or, or general you know approach to nutrition when it comes to people with diabetes. And so they look at it as, uh, you know, there's medications, so there's no reason for you to suffer and not get to eat cheesecake uh, just because you have diabetes. So that, yeah, <laughs> as ridiculous as it sounds, <laughs> that's our general approach. But um, getting back to the, the main question, um, I've found, you know, doing this for over 15 years. So by the way, what do we mean by low carbs? Right. So, uh, so carbohydrate foods uh, are foods that are higher in starch and sugar. So uh, all foods have carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So there is no one, you know, like even a white potato 
is not purely carbohydrate. There's a tiny bit of protein in there and a little bit of fat. So, you know, they all have all three, but like a white potato is mostly starch. Starch is long chains of glucose. So, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a lap pole and those, those uh, lane dividers, they have those little buoys that are all chained together. That's kind of like, uh, if you imagine those as glucose molecules, that's what a starch molecule looks like. And that's what's in a potato, that's what's in pasta, that's what's in breads and, and things like that. So when we eat those foods, uh, we have an enzyme called salivary amylase in our mouth that immediately starts to break those apart into sugar molecules, into glucose molecules. Um, sugar, on the other hand, is uh, a simple um, is a simple molecule, and there are different types of sugars, but table sugar, like white sugar that people sometimes put in their tea and coffee or honey, for example, is basically a combination of fructose and glucose. So glucose is what we measure in the blood when we measure blood sugar. Uh, fructose is an altogether different molecule that um, does not raise blood sugar, but uh, gets shuttled to the liver and uh, ultimately, typically stored as fat in the liver. So when we eat table sugar, we're eating about half fructose, which goes to the liver and gets converted to fat, and about half glucose, which gets absorbed into our bloodstream and either gets used uh, in the cells to, for fuel or gets stored. Um, and uh, again, the, insul the uh, hormone that's in control of that is, is insulin. So uh, anyway, what's a good amount of carbohydrate yeah, you measure like, carbohydrate example, in grams, I, right? Yeah, I saw I saw one recent paper where they were recommending a low carb diet that had uh, forty five percent carbohydrates. Right, exactly. So you know, a two thousand calorie diet, forty five percent is what like like you know, I don't know, eight hundred calories. That's like two hundred grams of carbs. You know, that's. Uh, that's a lot of carbs. And the average American consumes about two to 300 grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, so, and sometimes more, sometimes up to four or 500. So the average American is eating a lot of carbohydrate. And so you can see uh, why, uh, you know, we get these problems because it creates these surges of insulin, leads to insulin resistance, fat storage, and all sorts of other things. So we usually start at about 75 grams of carbohydrate, which is about 300 calories from carbohydrates a day. That ends up being around 10 to 15% of caloric uh, intake. And, uh, and oftentimes we'll go lower. Um, it's, it's really, we talk about eating to the meter. So, you know, we have our clients check their blood sugar, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll dial in their macronutrients, starting with about 75 grams of carbs, we, uh, we put together a, a protein recommendation and then uh, fill the rest in with healthy fats. And, uh, and then we do it in a way that's you know, healthy, non-refined, non-processed as much as possible uh, and, and, and make, it, uh, you know, make it accessible and doable for people. But uh, 75 grams is probably a good starting point. Uh, one last thing I'll mention on carbs is there's, uh, there's some confusion around net carbs, diabetes, diabetic carbs, and so forth. So uh, we do recognize net carbs. Net carbs is, uh, they're, they're still listing fiber as a carbohydrate on, on the labels, I believe. Um, and so if there's, uh, let's say there's uh, 15 grams of carbs in something like an avocado, uh, but 12 of those grams come from fiber, fiber doesn't really have any net effect on blood sugar. So uh, maybe a little bit, but not much. So uh, we generally subtract those out. So an avocado, if it's got 15 grams of total carbs, but 12 come from fiber, we would call that three net carbs. And that's how we would count that food. Uh, it, it, do you find it helpful to look at glycemic uh, index or glycemic load of carbs? A little bit. I mean, if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, yes. Um, so uh, if you're, you know, maybe in the pre-diabetic range or you're sort of like pre-pre-diabetes and just it's on your mind a little bit and, or, or you're an, a, like a, a marathon runner or an athlete that where you're eating a fair amount of carbohydrates for, for fuel, I do think it's best to eat slow carbs. Um, so carbs that break down more slowly, don't raise your blood sugar as quickly. So those would be things like, um, 
uh, legumes. starchy or, or like, uh, yeah, legume beans and legumes, uh, certain grains. If you want to eat grains like, um, uh, a barley, for example, is lower on the glycemic index than something like rice would be. Um, although I generally recommend steering away from grains. There are certain fruits like berries, which are considered low glycemic. Even apples are, are lower glycemic. If you stick with like a, a smaller apple or a half of an apple, uh, you can probably get away with that. Um, grapefruit and some citrus, lemons and limes are low glycemic. Uh, they don't have a ton of sugar in them. And, uh, and there's other foods like that. So you can pull up a glycemic index chart. I, I generally recommend sticking with the low glycemic category, uh, not, not the moderate or high glycemic categories. Okay. Um, what about intermittent fasting or fasting? And I, and I know that uh, for years we were preaching everybody needs to eat within an hour of waking up and then you should have a small meal or snack every three hours throughout the day. And now it's really popular, especially in uh, functional medicine, anti-aging and wellness circles to... Um, do some version of intermittent fasting, and frequently this involves skipping breakfast. Yeah, I just saw today that Dr. Oz is recommending everybody skips breakfast in 2020 now. So you know it's uh, you know it's hit the mainstream at this point. <laughs> but uh, yeah, intermittent fasting can be a, can be an effective strategy, and there's many different ways to do intermittent fasting. It doesn't just have to be skipping breakfast. Um, but it can be a very effective strategy. Uh, when I start a new client, we actually have them eat something within an hour of waking up. I'm not a big fan of grazing um, unless you're like a vegan and you're eating just a ton of leaves and plants and that's the majority of your diet like a gorilla. You know, a gorilla will eat um, actually a high protein diet, but they get most of their protein from leaves, but they're just eating like pounds and pounds, like 50 yeah. pounds of spinach a day, you know? <laughs> um, so if that's what you're doing, then graze. But other than that, um, I recommend eating you know, all your food within an hour, um, and then having like eating blocks. So, you know, you might eat from eight to 9 AM and then from noon to one and then you know, seven to eight or six to seven or something like that. And then don't eat in between. That'll allow your system to reset itself, uh, your insulin levels can fall, your glucose can get back in line, your body can function normally for a little while, and then you can eat again. So um, there, is, there is a time and a place for intermittent fasting, though, and I do recommend it a lot uh, once we get deeper into um, you know, a treatment plan with, with, with our clients. And it can be very helpful to allow insulin levels to come down. Um, it, it probably is not really going to have significant long-term benefits. Like I haven't seen a lot with stimulating autophagy and cell repair and things like that on a, you know, tacking on four hours to your nighttime fast, but it can help with hormone, flu hormone fluctuations and can help to re uh, resensitize our cells to insulin when uh, you're kind of early in the, in the process. Uh, I think longer term fasts can be even more beneficial uh, in after you like fast for 24, about 24 hours, hours or, yeah, tw 24 yeah. hours, you're going to kind of burn through all your glycogen stores. So you're going to deplete all your stored sugar. And so that's when you really start to tap into your uh, fat stores. The body starts to release more growth hormone after 24 hours, which helps to uh, maintain lean body mass and starts to upregulate fat burning. So um, you really start to gain some additional benefits past the 24 hour mark. Um, of course, you know, a lot of our clients are on medications, they're, they're injecting insulin. So, you know, having them do a long fast can be really difficult in the beginning. So we don't typically do that right out of the gate, but um, at some point along the, the way we do. And for someone who's, who's a little bit healthier, someone who has maybe the early signs of prediabetes or something, doing some extended fasting can be really helpful. The only time I don't recommend doing that is if there's a, a known thyroid issue that's not being managed well or adrenal fatigue or uh, adrenal dysregulation. Uh, those people uh, fast, like long fasts, can put a lot of stress on the body. And so I think it's best to heal those areas before we do long, long fasting. Um. I, I understand you have come up with some specific subtypes of type 2 diabetes as a way to uh, change, uh, uh, modify your treatment strategies. 
Yeah. So um, I know we're uh, a little short on time, so I'll run through it pretty quickly, but okay. there are uh, four subtypes essentially of type two diabetes. And uh, the first is a type O, which is uh, over uh, insulinized. And those are the people that we've mainly talked about today. They produce too much insulin. They're insulin resistant. We can test insulin levels. It's high. Uh, they tend to be overweight, maybe not obese, but at least overweight or have some, you know, vis the uh, visceral adiposity, like uh, uh, you know that apple shape. Um, so that's the most common of the subtypes. But there are three others. Um, the second one is I, which is the insulin subtype, and it's under insulinized. So uh, these are uh, folks who have type 2 diabetes. It's not type 1. It's not LATA. There's no autoimmune issue here, but they're underproducing insulin. And there's a variety of reasons for why that can happen. So they tend to be either normal weight or thinner on the thinner side. And uh, we check their insulin and it's actually low. And we do an insulin response test like we talked about earlier. And they don't release insulin as much as they're supposed to when they eat. So uh, those folks either need to be on a little bit of insulin or uh, oftentimes we can help to sort of revive the pancreas uh, to make more insulin again. Um, and there's different strategies that we use for that. Uh, there's two other subtypes which are uh, almost completely ignored. Uh, the, the third one is a type S, which is a stress type. A lot of people don't realize the connection between stress and high blood sugar, but it is a very potent connection. And that stress can come from lack of sleep, can come from gut dysbiosis, it can come from mental emotional stress, it can come from a loss of a loved one or divorce or separation or move or some other type of major life stress, major life event. It can come from chronic pain. Um, it can come from uh, hormone or, or uh, a number of other imbalances in the body, like chronic infection in the blood. So uh, these types of stressors will cause our adrenal glands to make extra cortisol and adrenaline, which raises our blood sugar. And that can ultimately lead to adrenal dysfunction. But in the meantime, we get uh, prediabetes and oftentimes type 2 diabetes. And so uh, we have clients where... Uh, their insulin's normal, uh, their blood sugar's high, but it doesn't look like a normal diabetes case. We find out they're, they've dealt with a tremendous amount of stress or they've just got this uh, chronic pain that's just always nagging them, driving stress into their system. And once that's handled, oftentimes their blood sugar will come back down into the normal range. The last type is type H, which is a hormone imbalance, and that can be sex hormones like testosterone or estrogen, progesterone, or more commonly, it's related to thyroid and adrenal hormones. So uh, not to be confused with type S, this is where the adrenal dysfunction is the primary thing. So uh, it's not that there's chronic stress or there's something that we can pinpoint there that we can handle. It's actually the hormone imbalance itself. So hypothyroidism, is oftentimes at the root of this, but we see adrenal dysfunction as well and other things. Um, there are a few other things that can show up like mitochondrial dysfunction um, and toxins, as we mentioned, but uh, those are the main four subtypes that we classify. And when we, when we uh, sort of look at a new client, we'll sort of think about those four as we, as we uh, create a care plan for them. I can see how those could be really useful. Um, we are a little bit short on time. Um, I'd like to uh, make the last question about uh, which um, nutritional supplements can be beneficial as part of an adjunct to your care for patients with diabetes or prediabetes. Yeah, great question. And um, I break supplements into two categories. So we look at nutrient-based supplements and botanical or herb-based supplements. So the nutrient-based supplements are things that we would normally find in our food, things like omega-3 oils, vitamin D, chromium, zinc, and so forth, and then magnesium. And then there are uh, herbal or botanical-based supplements, which are things like uh, cinnamon, berberine, turmeric, uh, curcumin, and, uh, and others. So uh, for me, the nutrient-based supplements are kind of a cornerstone. So uh, we want to eat a good diet. We want to use food as medicine. And then sometimes we can supplement to sort of fill in the gap. So 
most people I think need and can benefit from some omega-3 support. We just don't get those uh, healthy omega-3s in our diet as much as we should. And there's risk with fish uh, today, even though I recommend eating fish. So um, good omega-3 supplementation I think is important, somewhere between one and six grams of combined DHA and EPA per day. Um, and you can check the the label of the bottles. If, uh, if, if, the, if the bottle doesn't tell you how much EPA and DHA there is in the fish oil, then don't use it. Uh, make sure it tells you how much is in there and uh, then add those two up, EPA plus DHA, DHA, excuse me, and those should add up to a thousand or more per day. Um, and, uh, and there's certain ways of tweaking that depending on what we're trying to accomplish. I also recommend vitamin D for most of our clients. Uh, you can check, obviously, vitamin D, uh, 25 hydroxy on a blood test. It should be around 40 to 70. Uh, maybe a little higher is okay. And if it's not at least up in that range, then supplement with some vitamin D3. Typically, we're doing five, uh, 5,000 IUs per day, sometimes up to 10, um, and sometimes as little as two. But uh, somewhere in that range, I think is really helpful for people with diabetes. There's a clear connection between uh, vitamin D and insulin sensitivity and blood sugar regulation. Use vitamin well, K with the vitamin D? Yeah, especially if we get up into the higher doses, I think it's important to do some K2 um, uh, in particular. Um, you know, you can get vitamin K1 through through a lot of foods, but vitamin K2 is hard to find. So um, if, uh, if we're up over 5,000 units of D, we'll definitely add in some vitamin K2 as well. Okay. Um, I, I like chromium. Uh, chromium is uh, you know, important for glucose uh, regulation and glucose tolerance. Um, most people don't get enough chromium in their diet, so you can supplement anywhere between uh, 200 micrograms uh, up to 1,000 micrograms if you're trying to really make an impact on your blood sugar of chromium per day. I think that can be helpful. And it would uh, form? Um, yeah, either uh, uh, picolinate or polynicotinate. Both of those uh, have good research behind them and seem to be effective. And do you like um, vanadium as well? Uh, vanadium is a little trickier. Um, it is, you know, it's a, it's metal salt and it can, it can be toxic at certain levels. So, um, I use that one short term. Um, I'll use maybe 20 milligrams of uh, vanadium short term. Um, I think it's milligram, milligrams or micrograms. I can't remember. Um, but, uh, uh, but we'll use that one more short term. Um, I've seen supplements with 50, a hundred, I think it's milligrams of vanadium and um, that, uh, yeah, I you think know, it's, I think it's milligrams. Yeah. That, that uh, uh, I think there's some caution there. Um, so I, I'd be a little bit careful with pushing the vanadium up too high, but vanadium uh, sort of has insulin like effects on the cells. And uh, there are some studies that show, you know, vanadium supplementation can, can sort of act as insulin and help to reduce blood sugar. Uh, I'll use vanadium more in people who don't make enough insulin and, and uh, it can be helpful in some cases. Uh, magnesium, really important um, for many, many reasons. Good blood sugar health um, is, is one of them. And then um, on the herb front, um, berberine can be really effective. Uh, berberine is a alkaloid compound found in golden seal and other flowers. It's... Um, uh, uh, it, it acts in several different ways to improve uh, glucose utilization and insulin sensitivity. And uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most effective compounds we have. Uh, cinnamon can be good as well, especially if you're eating carbohydrate and you want to lessen the impact of carbohydrate on your blood sugar system. Uh, taking some cinnamon at mealtime can be really helpful. And uh, berberine is kind of a natural form of metformin and can also be used synergistically with uh, metformin, correct? Has, has many of the same mechanisms of action as metformin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, metformin is not derived from berberine. It's a, it's, a, it's a different chemical structure altogether, but they do have similar mechanisms of action. Yeah. And it can actually be used concurrently, right? It can, yeah. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, usually what we'll do is sort of balance. Like if somebody's maxed out on metformin, we're not going to max them out on berberine also. But, um, but oftentimes we'll do like a little transition where we'll uh, work with their doctor to back down on metformin and increase the berberine. And that can help them. Uh, it can be less of a stress on the kidneys 
and uh, less stress on the gastrointestinal system. Uh, metformin uh, is really hard on the GI tract. It depletes vitamin B12. Uh, it interferes with vitamin B12 absorption and interferes with the production of coenzyme Q10. So I don't like to see people maxed out on metformin for too long if we can help it, even though it's, it's a pretty safe drug. So if we can help to replace some of that with berberine or something else, it can be helpful. Great. Um, any other herbs? Well, um, I, like, I like green drinks and I like chlorella. Uh, okay. Chlorella is a, uh, basically an algae that's high in, um, pretty high in iron. It has some protein, you know, by weight it's high in protein and it's very detoxifying. It's um, very energizing. It's got a lot of chlorophyll. So um, I like to do some chlorella and um, I love to do green drinks, which is like basically powdered vegetable and, you know, uh, fruit extracts. Um, usually they're very low carbohydrate, very low calorie and can give you a nice burst of energy. And um, I actually like to use those as sort of a multi um, because they, you know, it's, it's kind of plant medicine. It's got uh, all sorts of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, phytochemicals that, uh, you know, we don't even necessarily haven't even identified yet um, and certainly haven't put into pills. So um, I like to use food as medicine whenever possible and, and a green drink is a great way to do that. That's great. Awesome. Um, I think we'll wrap there. Can you tell our listeners how to get a hold of you and find out about your programs? Yeah. So uh, probably the best way, um, I have my own podcast called Mastering Blood Sugar. I'd love to have you on there, Doc, uh, maybe sometime here in the future. But Sounds Mastering great. Blood Sugar, you can check out Apple. We'll be starting on our iTunes. We'll be starting uh, uh, our next season here relatively soon. And um, uh, for other information, just go to drmole.com. That's D-R-M-O-W-L-L.com. Um, I have a uh, uh, a resource on my website called the Blood Sugar Manifesto, which is free to download. And uh, it's basically uh, got all my best advice in there, uh, some information about supplements, diet, exercise, stress management, sleep management, all those things are included. So if you want to get some good free information, go to drmold.com and download that Blood Sugar Manifesto. This has been a great podcast, Doc. I, I got a lot of good information. Um, I, I have a ton of additional questions. So if you're up to it, maybe uh, maybe we could do a part two at some point in the future. Yeah, I would love to do that. Okay, maybe a little bit great. of a deeper dive. It'd be great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, Doc. Thanks for having me on.